this more widely uh, when inmates, uh, either inmates who we identify in advance of transfer from prison to the community who we believe have the skills and the abilities and the wherewithal, they have some family support, we believe they have the skills to acquire a job, we, we in fact are transferring some directly from prison to home detention in lieu of putting them in a halfway house. The majority of them are going to the halfway house for a period of time to get established, uh, reaffirm our belief that they could be successful on home detention, and then we transfer them to home detention. We're doing this for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we want to free up those halfway house beds for the most needy inmates we have, those that don't have the family support, those that don't have necessarily the skills we would like them to have to acquire the jobs. They need more structure, more direction than some who already have those skills and have family support. So we're trying to better utilize the beds that we have. And in doing so, we're trying to reserve those beds in the halfway house for the individuals who have the most critical need, been incarcerated longer, lack family support, don't necessarily have the skills that we would like them to have to acquire jobs. And we have that wherewithal within this community. And that's, that's, I think that's noteworthy, Congresswoman. I mean, many communities resist accepting their returning offenders, and we can't even get halfway houses. Here, we're fortunate to have Hope Village and Fairview and an organization like Our Place. We need more of them. I applaud their work, such that when that transition occurs, there is support in the community from family, friends, or social organizations. Those we find are going to be far more successful uh, offenders than those that don't have those Let me understand, so... Well, it looks, how many women are in the halfway house at the moment at Fevu, Fevu? There are uh, about 60. <laughs> better. Ms. Bennett knows, <laughs> knows also well. Uh, all right, 60. Now, there, there are only five D.C. code offenders on home detention. That seems like a quite small number, we, uh, especially because women have, have, have normally not been convicted uh, for um, violent offenses. Um, why, why is that number so small, especially given the overcrowding, the need for the space for, uh, at, at Fairview and the like? Only have one place in D.C. For, for women. So you would think there might be more. Our, our, my numbers reflect that right now we've got, we have 24 at Fairview. There are three on home detention. Um, without a doubt, when we compare the female D.C. Code offenders to our other female federal offenders, they, they have many more challenges in the way of support. M many of them are homeless. We can't put them on home detention unless we are satisfied. And I'm saying this is the case, but uh, without a doubt, bigger challenge for us because they sometimes don't have that family support or structure that we believe is necessary. So, again, I'd have to go back and, and I, can, I certainly do that, look at the 21 are there to see whether or not we have overlooking somebody that could go. Mm -hmm. But the halfway house has to have confidence, as do we, that if we put them out there in the community, uh, they're going to be in a situation that is supportive and nurturing of mm -hmm. that transition. Uh, if we're unsure, well, that, we'll that, that certainly makes house. sense, uh, uh, Mr. Lappin. Do you, Ms. McSwain, uh, supervise the, the women on home detention? Well, who does? That would be the staff at Fairview in this case. They're, they're not here. Oh, our place. Now, uh, this is our, our place. Our is, is a support yes, organization yeah. for both Fairview yeah, and Bureau. We had uh, Fairview here at a prior hearing. Yes. Miss um, Day, uh, you say in your testimony, <laughs> I am a smart and intelligent individual. And I must say, in your testimony, you certainly demonstrated that. And I hope uh, that the initial nervousness um, was overcome, I think, by the very intelligence you described. Now, you say in your testimony, though, that, and here I'm quoting you, to some degree I believe that being under D.C. code was better than being a federal inmate. What do you mean? Well, um, when I got to Hazleton, there were a lot, and I think because it was a new facility, that they uh, put a whole lot of programs in place, and they didn't differentiate whether you were a federal prisoner or a D.C. Code uh, prisoner. Um, everything was open now to Now, you were a D.C. Code. Yeah, I'm a yes. D.C. Code prisoner. Uh, 
but everything was open to us. Um, the only thing that was not open to me was the drug program because I didn't have for 24 months, and by the time I got to the feds, I only had 14 months left. Um, and you so have why do you say being, what's the difference here? The, the, the difference is, is that a, a lot of the uh, prisoners that I was incarcerated with that were not DC code prisoners, were, they had longer sentences. They were shipped way, way away from home. Um, they were not eligible for some of the programs because of what their charges was. I did, um, they have a program in Hazleton where you, uh, where the inmates actually watch other inmates that's on suicide watch. I was able to do that. Some of the other prisoners weren't able to but do that. But were you able to do that only because you were DC code? Uh, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think it was because I, I wanted, I expressed the interest. Mm -hmm. um, they were shipping ladies out left and right. I, I, I stayed at home. For whatever reason, I stayed close to home. So you, you benefited by staying yeah, uh, I did. close, I actually, close to home. I actually did benefit by staying close to home. Um, I've always had real good family support. Um, the only reason why I didn't have visits on a res regular basis is because my mom is disabled. But I was able to call home every day. I emailed home every day. And when I came home, my family was at the halfway house waiting on me. Now you were, you, you have been uh, in prison on more than one occasion. Were you always? No. No, only just been once? In prison once. Oh, this only just been in once. Prison once. I have a lot of charges. I have a lot of convictions. Oh, that's the difference. Um, I see. Yeah, I do. I have a lot of convictions. Um, but I've only been in prison once. Uh, those whatever. convictions, yeah, the, the, uh, those convictions came uh, pursuant to this incarceration. Yes, yeah. and, and, and all of my convictions are direct result. I have a 30-year drug history, um, and, and I was actually, uh, when I'm not using, I have a sporadic drug history. When I'm not using, I do exactly what I'm supposed to do. I maintain employment. I take care of my kids. Um, I become a responsible what, member of what, society. What freed you from the drug habit? You know what? I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'm tired. I honestly believe, because I've been in several different drug programs, unless you're tired, drug program ain't going to work anyway. If you get a year off or you get 20 years off, if you ain't tired, it ain't going to work. And I guess that I was tired. Um, I got a whole lot of support from my family. I mean, because I burnt bridges. I burnt a lot of bridges, but my family didn't see that. And then I got support from our place that I got from no place else. You have agencies that um, go through the motions, and they do according to what their contracts say that they do. I got an uh, email to everybody at our place. It don't matter what I'm going through. All I need to do is email somebody, and I get an email right back. I get a phone call right back. I got a mentor this time. Um, I don't do NA and AA because something about listening to stories kick up a feeling, so I don't do them. But my mentor is, is, is actually uh, my sponsor, and we talk about everything. If I need to talk now, to you. Were in, and you were incarcerated where, again, please? SFF Hazelden. What? Hazelden. Hazelden, yeah. yeah. And I mean, we had a conversation when you came to Hazelden. Uh, and my question to you was actually, why didn't people who had 24 months or less were able for the drug program? I didn't care about the time off. I maxed out September the 15th anyway, if I went to the drug program or not. But I think with a person with a drug history like mine, I used everything from a bare aspirin to you name it. You know. Um, I think I should have been entitled to the drug program because I asked for it. Well, now, you say uh, uh, a certain number of months, uh, uh, Ms. Day says a certain number of months are involved in access to the drug program? There, there are actually two different programs. Uh, there is a non-residential program which does not require any minimum stay and any inmate can participate in it. It's not nearly as intensive. It's more education-based. Uh, and you don't live in the unit with the other inmates. The residential program, the 500-hour residential drug abuse program, requires a, a minimum of about 24 months. That's to get you through almost a year-long, more intensive treatment, followed by a period of time in a halfway house where that treatment continues, and then on to release. So that's why there is a minimum I see. requirement. It's just a more intense. You need the time yep. in order to complete the program. Now, Ms. Bennett. Yes, ma'am. Um, you were incarcerated far yes. from home. Yes, ma'am. Now, how, where, 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 how many facilities 
Just uh, straight to um, Coleman in Tampa, Florida. In Florida. Mm -hmm. And I swear I did majority of my time down before they made me eligible to, to go to Tallahassee for the drug program. And you did receive yes, the, I was the intensive residential drug program? Yes, ma'am. The 500, I successfully completed it. Do you believe it is that program that freed you from drugs? No, ma'am. I surrendered myself when I went to prison. When I sat in a cell down, downtown in the <laughs> that I knew that I was giving up. You know, I just, everything that I used to do, I knew I couldn't do it anymore. So I surrendered myself. But Mr. Laffin, um, here is a, a D.C. president. When, did you, when were you incarcerated, uh, Ms. Bennett? May 2004. Um, who was sent to, to Florida and I understand that uh, are there any women like Miss Bennett that far away from home now you heard what Miss Day said just being this close to home apparently was instrumental in, in her um, in, 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 in her rehabilitation so that now she's a tax, pre tax preparer um, are there any women outside of the facilities that are at least 500 miles from, that are no more than 500 miles from the District of Columbia? Uh, there are. There are 11. But I looked at all 11 of those. Actually, there's, there's oh, 11 uh, women? There's only 30, 36, if you include the 25 that are at Carswell. So there are 25 women outside the 500 mile distance who are mm -hmm. Carswell, pr probably for medical care, or because they volunteered to participate in the Life Connections residential program, which is a residential based, but it's a volunteer program. Beyond that, there are 11 uh, who are outside the 500 miles. There are uh, six at Tallahassee, there are four at Waseca, and there's one in Dublin. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the majority of them uh, either have separatees at one of the other facilities or more that are in closer proximity, that is they can't be housed with someone, or Unfortunately, they've been uh, disciplinary problems. Well, one, in fact, has been moved 10 times. And so um, th those are the 11 we have currently that are outside the 500-mile, uh, the besides it's, the 25. Well, it that looks are like, you, at least within the con constraints uh, that you have, it looks like the, the, the BOP is making an effort. Uh, could I ask that you make an effort, a further effort, so that no D.C. woman who did not have special uh, issues would be outside of the 500 mile or uh, 250 mile. We will certainly make the effort, and as I've shared with you before, it's typically medical. We understand. We or, understand. Or, or they have many separatees who are incarcerated, so they can't be housed. Well, these together. 11 uh, are all of these women in the, in those special they, categories. I believe all all 11 of these are. I'll check to make sure, but I think all 11 of them fall into one of those categories: either healthcare, separatees, or discipline. Well, if these women were flagged so that only those, uh, and perhaps they have been, if you say all 11 fall into these special categories, then of course we would be getting somewhere. Uh, uh, as you know, Mr. Lappin, um, while it would take a, a further effort, it does seem to me, given the number of facilities uh, that the BOP has, that a facility could be converted uh, to uh, the District of Columbia, where men and women could indeed be um, placed. Um, do you see any, um, I recognize the difficulty, uh, but other than the administrative difficulties and the uh, issues involved in such a conversion, uh, would you regard that as at least something of a possibility? We can consider that, although, as I've said before, I, I, I believe that it would be un, uh, less safe than what we have today. Less safe? Less safe. Why would it be less safe, Mr. Uh, I, I won't say so much so for the women, but more so for the men, uh, in that we, again, believe that uh, facilities that are balanced, both racially and uh, geographically, are safer in facilities Mr. Lappin, 50 percent, as Mr. Davis <laughs> indicated, uh, of those of, of felons are African American men. You can't. <laughs> I mean, you must. I understand that there have been court suits, and and um, we we want to make sure we're not quote segregating people, 
but of the values, uh, uh, penology values. It, 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 it uh, the notion that, that um, um, I suppose I'd have to ask you, I can understand the, the, the notion of, of um, safe, but Mr. Lappin, these are state felons. Uh, the Congress regarded um, BOP as capable of handling state felons. And as between, uh, so the notion that it would be more difficult to have people, yeah, who are more likely to be convicted of murder and armed ro robbery, yeah, it would be something special that uh, perhaps you would have to conform to. But compared to being in 115 facilities scattered throughout the planet as far as they're concerned, do you think the BOP is incapable of handling uh, about our men and women being spread across the country? We asked you about uh, placing video conferencing equipment uh, at every BOP facility that houses DC code felons. So at least you could say, hi, out there, DC. I don't know what it's like here in Wyoming, but I, I am glad to see a face there that I know. Have we made any, uh, uh, as you can see, this bothers me tremendously. Because I think you're dumping some problems in our lap, Mr. Lappin. When you give them a bus ticket, send them home homeless, there's not enough room for them in a halfway house, who you think is going to pick up that slack? So I'm trying to deal with this the best way I can in keeping with your rules. So let's, try, let's, let's start with video conferencing. Any, any, any progress on, on investigating whether you could do more video conference? We have it at Rivers. I don't think we have it anywhere else. So if we do, I'd be glad to hear about it. Uh, we do not, and we are exploring what technology is available that would allow us to connect. Uh, it's going to be complicated a little bit because this has to go through the Justice Network program, so there are security requirements that are going to be burdensome. Uh, but we're certainly exploring that, not only for uh, people from Washington, D.C., but other offenders who are far from their homes as well. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear it because I think given the fact that you, you have federal prisoners who are in the same position as D.C. prisoners, although incarcerated under different code, under different circumstances, anything that helps people go home and uh, reintegrate into civil society would be, I think, welcome. Well, we, we, I, I believe in years to come this will be used widely. Uh, but again, there are some limitations on technology, and we have to make sure we, uh, we abide by the security right, limitations. Let's do this, Mr. Lappin. Because I asked you about this on May 5th. Now, we cl it, we, we three months later, 30 days, uh, I would like uh, you to submit to the chairman of this subcommittee what progress you are making on video conferencing and in what facilities? 30 days. Sure. Just progress. We don't say have in place. We just want to know progress. Um, we were concerned that the Correction Information Council, that's a local DC council that was set up by the district so that the district could go into BOP facilities, um, was in fact not functioning. I don't even think the district any longer, or I think they gave up even appointing people. Um, uh, you, you were going to see what was necessary so that members of this council could visit BOP facilities. Uh, in the normal course, uh, what, what progress has been made in that regard? I'm not sure that anyone has reappointed members. Uh, it was my understanding that, that someone is going to alert them that we are willing to move forward. We have a program statement or a memorandum of understanding in yeah. draft form. Well, what, it, it is true we, that we it would take a memorandum. It would, it, it, we, we would need the, um, a memorandum of, of understanding between the CIC or the district government and the BOP. Could you initiate um, that memorandum of understanding so that we could proceed here? I would ask Sosa, Ms. Potiate, if you would work with Ms. Mr. Lappin and the appropriate DC officials 
to see if something of the kind was was possible in that case at least there could be some 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 officials from the district who could report back and forth there's lots good to report i have visited your facilities and but our folks just don't have any idea about them we will uh, reach out to the district government and see if we can arrange a meeting to to see where we're going to go we have the mou uh, we just need some uh, people appointed we'll reach out to them and respond back to you thank you very much mr lappin um um you indicate on page seven of your testimony that you need new legislation to expand the federal uh, prison industries. What, what, what do you mean by that? As you know, uh, federal prison industry was created back in 1933, and uh, it gave certain um, statutes and mandates for the operation of that. Over the course of years, some, some of the requirements have been watered down by other legislation. Uh, the mandatory source requirement being one that has resulted in fewer opportunities for us to employ inmates in prison factories. And consequently, so this is statutory. This is statutory. Yeah. And we, I, I tell you, this is can get complex. Yeah. We'd lo love to meet with you and your staff and dis or your staff, address the details uh, rather than burdening the entire group here with this. It's been gone going for 15 or 20 years. Uh, we believe we run safer prisons because we have inmates productively employed, and we know based on our research that those who work in prison industry are less likely to recidivate and more likely to get a job. On the other hand. Uh, some are critical of the fact they believe we may be taking jobs away from law-abiding citizens' businesses. We don't want to do that either. Yeah. So we, we kind of need to figure out how we can move forward and uh, provide the jobs without having as much of an impact on other citizens' businesses. But I would offer to you the opportunity to sit down and chat about prison I'd very much like to do that because I see two legitimate concerns here. Absolutely. Very legitimate concerns, especially in this kind of job climate. If people feel you can go to jail and get a job. Absolutely. <laughs> um, there might be people lining up to get into the BOP these days. There are five people for every job available out here. And, and so there's legitimate concern. On the other hand, if there are some things you do, do and I know that I have some idea from visits, some of those things, then I would very much like to meet with the appropriate staff to see uh, what, uh, some of this may not require statutory change. We, we'd love to work with you. And uh, I mean, we, they learn work skills, it's not necessarily a vocational. They, they, they are learn to come to work on time. They learn to work with peers. They learn to work with a supervisor. Uh, these are skills that many of them lack because they've not been in that type of environment prior to incarceration. So again, we would love to work with you on this mm -hmm. issue. Now, I have one final question. Uh, if, as I understood, Ms. McSwain, you work in the prisons as well? Yes, we go into uh, the facilities and implement programming. So, we do so that, that's, that's what I'd like to discuss mm -hmm. finally. Um, the relationship you have with um, effective uh, reentry organizations like our place, how does that work and how can we get more of it? Hmm. Would you like me to start? Um, sure. <laughs> um, we think this is a great opportunity. And in fact, I, in our opinion, this kind of sets the example of what could occur if there were more willing participants like our place and correctional organizations that are willing to allow this to occur. And so the, the more contact that a local entity support group can have with the inmate during reentry, I believe the more successful but what we're going to be. I'm trying to find out the mechanics. How did our place get into the prisons? Well, the founder was working in the prison doing programming and she built uh, our place to respond to the needs of the women reentering. And through that process, she began to build relationships with the prison officials. And in my, during my term, you know, I've reached out to the, pro, the programming directors within the prisons, talked about our work, and they've, because they're very interested in the needs of female offenders, 
they've invited our programs in. And, and so, so what do you do? So we go to FDC Philadelphia, Hazleton, Alderson. We offer employment programming. So we talk about how do you um, talk about your employment history, to your um, incarceration history to an employer. We have an HIV and AIDS awareness program where it's a program called SISTA where we teach the inmates, you know, about HIV and AIDS awareness and prevention. We train them. They train other inmates. We offer legal. Are these D.C. inmates or general? All D.C. inmates, D.C. inmates. And so we is it, is it, is, are there other, other places, other programs like our place in federal there, prisons? There, there's another organization called Hope House operated by oh, Carol Fenley. I know her. And, yes. she, and she actually facilitates uh, weekend retreats or uh, events where parents and their children, I'm sorry, the children of the incarcerated mm -hmm. can go to institutions and spend two or three days interacting. And so there are, there are several other organizations. Uh, it's not widespread around the country. I, I think I see the most of this here in Washington, D.C., which is encouraging. Uh, but again, I don't know what's happening at every one of the local 115 prisons, but this is, this is noteworthy work. The, also, our newest um, program was to bring case management into the facilities four months before a woman is released and then also follow her six months after she's released. And with that project, the prisons have been very open to allowing us to support the women while she's still in custody. And that program is done at Hazleton and FDC Philadelphia and the Fairview and the Correctional Treatment Facility. We've also built a relationship with CSOSA so that we can also continue to support the women when she's released. So it requires a collaboration with all of the institutions that are touching the women before they are released and once they're released into the community, having our place provide some guidance and some coaching as they manage all of these various relationships. Now, you do this work pursuant to grants from the D.C. government? I have one grant from the D.C. government. Um, it was a recent grant, um, and that has allowed us to this pilot project. But we don't get a because lot of you grants. Say, sorry? We don't have a lot of grants from the D.C. government. So is, is it private philanthropy? Uh, a lot of um, foundation grants. We have um, the HIV and AIDS administration, I guess that's D.C., um, also funds mm -hmm. our prevention program. But we're struggling well, for we, funding. You, it, it sounds to me as though you have multiplied your your effect in, in quite extraordinary ways. You serve 1,324 women. 634 were in custody. Yes. And 241 at Fairview. Yes. So most of the women you serve were in custody. Yes. We go into the facilities every single month. Every single month we go to Philadelphia. Every other month we go to Hazleton. Every single week we're either at Fairview or CTF. In light of the fact that even these uh, facilities are not within walking distance <laughs> or, or easily, uh, e easily accessed, uh, we need to know more about this in-prison mm -hmm. uh, work because it is re-entry work. Yes. Um, yes. Ms. Uh, Poitier, is the SOSA in prison? We go to the Rivers Correctional Facility and we do a resource day there where we take a host of not only uh, potential vendors or employers, we take mentors, uh, we take the like Department of Housing, uh, medical services, and we start working with the offenders prior to their release. In my testimony, I indicated now we will be working very closely with our place and doing the mentoring right now with Hazleton and FDC uh, Philadelphia. And so we will do resource days with them as well in the future. Well, to tell you the honest and goodness truth, Ms. Potier, I'd like to see you have the kind of presence in, 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 in uh, institutions that apparently this small organization has. I mean, have you served uh, 1,324 prisoners uh, in the kind of way she's talking about with um, with HIV AIDS and, and she, here she says um, of the women re, really, uh, women 634 were in custody 241 were at, at Fairview and the balance was in the community 
Um, 60 percent received legal counseling. 23 percent received birth certificates. What does that mean? Meaning that when the women are released from custody and they're trying to get into a housing program. Oh, birth certificates, birth certificates for, certificates for their own birth certificates. Yeah. 21 received funding for identification and 17 percent received funding for police clearance. Uh, are you doing that in, in, in prisons, uh, in, 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 in the federal prisons? You, Ms. Poteet. Oh, we do. Uh, we help people get the uh, Social Security cards and we help them get the non-driver's identification. We work with Department of Motor Vehicles. Once they get back here. That's correct. Ms. Poteet, I would like to see a greater presence of Sosa in prisons. To do that, you would probably need additional staff. You know, Ms. McSwain, I'm sure, needed some too. She's a whole lot smaller than, uh, and this is something I'd like to work with you with the appropriators. Uh, pending trying to deal more forthrightly with reentry, we have got to do something about these 115 facilities. Now, I can't expect, expect uh, uh, um, Sosa to, to go across the country, but Rivers, for goodness sakes, that's only one facility. And it does seem to me that if we have a small organization like this, which has put itself right in the prison, put itself there, that we ought to investigate giving Sosa more of a presence so that your job isn't made doubly hard because you can't touch prisoners, most of them, uh, can't have a touch with them until they get back home. Um, she has some early and systematic contact, uh, albeit with far fewer, although I'm telling you the numbers here are, are fairly impressive. Um, we've got to find ways to bridge this this gap, and it, it means thinking more creatively than we've done. Sosa does uh, a fine job once people get back here, but you're already behind the eight ball. Um, you can't affect facilities that are some distance away, but there's more than, than rivers to affect, uh, and um, there's more that we should be doing to push uh, video uh, conferencing. It shouldn't be just me at hearings pressing this. Uh, Mr. Lappin is going to see what he can do, but the lack of communication between our people and home is, is a, a clearly a big issue in this town. And we have got to do better in finding a way to, in fact, incorporate everything we do to increasing that contact. Um, Mr. Lappin. Let me just clarify. I think that the opportunity for video conferencing with, with Sosa is much more viable and, and likely than video conferencing for visiting. That, that's more complex. Say that again. The video conferencing with another federal agency like Sosa is very doable, which might facilitate some of that in lieu Certainly. of travel. That's how you've and been so doing wanna, it before, I, wanna, I, I think, I want to anyway. clarify the, the dilemma with video conferencing is more so with trying to offer that to citizens to visit with their family who are in prison. So that's going to be a little more complex. But, the video but, but Sosa should be the intermediary that well, facilitates but we, that. We, we, I think the video conferencing opportunities between us and Sosa are much more an option that could put them into more of those facilities uh, to have more direct contact with people if that's amenable. Well, that's excellent. You see there's a marriage right there, Ms. Poteet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we've already started that marriage as right. we've expanded right. that. That's All correct. Right. Thank you very much. I want to thank each and every one of these witnesses. What were there, six of you? Obviously, uh, the, the officials get asked uh, more and tougher questions, but I assure you that the testimony of each of you uh, was very valuable to us. And I do have a special word for Ms. Day and Ms. Bennett. Um, you break down stereotypes when you agree to appear at a hearing like this. You enlighten us in ways most of us have no other way to discern. We just do not have cont enough contact. And yes, the whole world is judgmental when it doesn't have contact. It took guts to come here. You got plenty of guts and I thank you for your guts. <laughs> I sure did. Thank you. The hearing is adjourned. Thank you.
as we refight.